My name is Bashar Safar. I am uh, the chief of colorectal surgery at Hopkins, and um, I'm going to speak a little bit about surgery for IBD. I've broken my talk into separate rather than combine the diseases. i speak about Crohn's a little bit, and then I'll speak about ulcerative colitis. This is meant to be really more general themes rather than specific disease problems. Surgery for Crohn's, um, again, tends to be very much individualized, so there's not one size that fits all, but there are some general principles that we will follow. The distribution of the disease essentially for Crohn's could be anywhere from the mouth to the anus. It's a primarily a GI disease, but as we heard earlier, it could be other extra-intestinal manifestations. The terminal ileum is the most commonly affected area, but you can also get Crohn's colitis. And um, most patients present with a variety of issues, but the most common would be abdominal pain, weight loss, diarrhea. Again, most patients start with inflammation, and then as the inflammation goes on, you either have a perforation or a narrowing. So if you have a narrowing, patients will have cramping, they get distended as they uh, once after meals, or vomiting. If it's a perforation, then they'll have infections, abscesses that need to be dealt with. So most, this is an old slide, um, that's a GI actually slide, but I think it really describes the disease very well. Every patient comes in and they have inflammation almost 100% of the time, that's the orange part of the slide. And as you treat them, as their treatment goes under, un, gets underway, with time, some inflammation, well, we hope that most of the inflammation settles, but some go on to become stricturing disease, some go on to become penetrating disease, which means they, penetrating is like um, either a fistula or an abscess. It's a hole in the bowel in the GI tract, and that could be to anything. You know, you can fistulize or you can, as I said, just have an abscess inside the abdominal cavity, and um, that needs to be drained because that is active infection. This next three slides really talks about surgery over time in Crohn's disease and this was published a few a couple of years ago and the risk of surgery after one year is about 15 percent once you've had the disease for five years it's 30 percent and this is both abdominal and rectal and once you've had the disease for 10 years it's about 50 percent so a lot of the patients about half of the patients will end up having surgery in their lifetime of some sort uh, you really don't want to see me unless you have to as a Crohn's patient because there is no cure for the Crohn's for these patients at this time. Surgery is to deal with complications, whether it's uh, infectious or whether it's obstructing. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, that's what surgery does. So for lack of better description, surgery is palliative. It's not curative. Um, but what's important and what we do well, I think, at Hopkins is have an IBD team. Um, uh, Dr. Dudley Brown and I share many patients and we tend to sort of see patients early on. So when patients come to see me, that's not necessarily just because they need surgery. Sometimes they just want to talk about surgery, what it means for them, what are the approaches, what is, you know, what is the long-term outlook. Um, we need to get a really good understanding of how much this bowel is involved um, and, and uh, make a sort of a plan down the road. And Dr. Brown again touched on a lot of the other things, you know, quit smoking, continue the medication, should not really stop, because all these things will increase the likelihood of having um, surgery or emergency surgery later on down the road, and that really is something that we want to avoid. What are absolute indications as patients who come in with a bad perforation, they have bad infections or bad bleeding? These are not very common, really. I mean, in Crohn's disease, you're talking about relative indications, and it's patients who've slowly gotten worse over time with infections and or um, an ability to uh, maintain um, basically thriving, you know, weight, uh, pain, et cetera, et cetera. What about surgery? When we go to surgery, what are our options? Um, really, I would say resection is our primary option in the GI tract. And again, as I mentioned, the small bowel is our primary target. We keep removing the bowel to a minimum. Only what's diseased, what's obviously diseased comes out. We do not really consider giving a patient a stoma, i.e. a bag or an appliance to empty the, you know, the, the waste through uh, unless they're very sick, meaning they've lost a lot of weight over a short period of time. They um, have an active infection that we cannot put a connection back in the middle of a big abscess. Uh, 
if we've lost a lot of blood in surgery, which again we, we, we don't typically run into. Um, and this last one is TNF-alpha inhibitors. That's a relative one. We feel at Hopkins, or most of us surgeons at Hopkins, feel like that's not a, an absolute indication to have someone have a, an ostomy, but it does increase the risk of anastomotic problems, you know, when you put someone together. Strictroplasty is a way of not removing the bowel, but rearranging things. So you have a narrowing. I'll show you some pictures. So they have, there's a narrowing in the bowel, as you see on the far right side of the screen. Uh, we open it alongside the bowel wall and then close it uh, in the exact opposite direction at 90 degrees. So essentially, effectively, you know, removing that narrowing. And the other two, the finny and this other one, the isoperistaltic stristroprasis, is to address long strictures. Now, especially the last two are really only applicable in patients with short bowel, whereby if you remove this segment, they're going to end up with very short bowel, and therefore we try to <coughs> avoid any resections. The reality of the matter is the bowel that's strictured is ability to absorb is probably significantly reduced. We do not perform those extensive ones very often at all. In fact, we don't perform strictroplasties in general much anymore because it, essentially if you have one area that's diseased, we just remove that area and put things together again. It only is applicable if you have multiple area that are diseased, areas that are diseased and they are separated by large segments of bowel, then we would consider it. This is how we do it. We know there's a narrowing in the bowel. We put a catheter with a balloon, and we try and drag it through, and if it doesn't move past an area, then we feel that that area is significantly narrowed, and we need to do something about it. Uh, this is uh, intraoperative pictures of the same thing. We open it alongside the bowel. If you see you know, the, that sort of yellow stuff at the bottom, that's sort of the mesentery where the fat coming into the bowel, the blood supply, we open it alongside one side and then we close it the other. And that essentially removes the obstruction. And we do that um, in two layers. There's a very, very small chance of having a cancer in those strictures. And we recommend if you're going to do a strictroplasty to take a biopsy of that area that's narrowed. Laparoscopy, um, not really debatable much. I think it's definitely the preferred approach. If you have complicated Crohn's disease, however, with a lot of internal fistulae and or the bowel that's involving a large area that's perforated, then I think the safety is questionable. And I think what you really want is a safe operation. But if it's possible to do it laparoscopically, it's the way to go. For straightforward ileal resection, laparoscopy, I think, has been shown to be to cause less morbidity from the wounds and no more complications from anastomosis or anything. So it's definitely the preferred approach. Um, however, I would say for complex disease, it, it might not be appropriate. We take every case on case-by-case -case basis. We look at the CT, we look at the MRI, we you know, look at the patient themselves and have a long discussion as to how we should do this. There's no difference in the rate of recurrence from, from resections if they've done laparoscopic or open. So if possible, do it open. ECHO, um, I would encourage anybody to sort of look at their guidelines if they're about to go to surgery or have treatment. ECHO is the European um, Society for Crohn's and Colitis, and they put out guidelines, and this is the latest guidelines from 2017. And they have actually guidelines or recommendations for almost anything that you talk about, whether what, what kind of therapy you should be on and, and what kind of surgery you should have. And they really say that um, uh, laparoscopic approach is preferred, also, when you have a connection, they, should, they, they recommend a staple side to side. That's another discussion that surgeons sometimes have, whether you should put them together end to end or side to side. And it seems to have the least type of complications. So in summary, surgery for Crohn's, it's not curative, it's palliative. We would like to optimize nutrition as much as possible. Um, a good communication between the gastroenterologist and the surgeon is, is, is key because um, what, what we see sometimes, patients who we don't have in our system, they come from outside, is they, they might have left things a little bit too late and gotten a little too sick, and that makes surgery a little bit more complicated and might have to be staged. Uh, data on uh, medications such as infliximab and other TNF-alpha inhibitors is conflicting. I'm not sure it's clear as to whether you, you should delay surgery or do different surgery if you're on these medications for Crohn's. And laparoscopy's approach is preferable if possible.
So that's, that, that settles that for Crohn's. Um, I, the next section I'll spend some time speaking about surgery for ulcerative colitis, which I feel is obviously a little bit different to, to the first disease entity. Ulcerative colitis is a disease confined to the GI, to the colon, um, at least, uh, and the rectum, and only affects only uh, not the entire wall, but sometimes it's diff difficult to tell, but not the entire wall of the colon. It is sometimes difficult to tell whether this patient have Crohn's or, or ulcerative colitis or indeterminate colitis because they have severe colitis. But the bottom line is if you know it's ulcerative colitis, the, um, the, the treatment or at least the goals are a little bit clearer. Once you take out the disease, the surgery should be curative. You know, this, they should not have ulcerative colitis anymore. Now, they might have other problems, but they should not have ulcerative colitis anymore. The indications today for surgery are either cancer risk or failure of medical therapy. And in the second one that I mentioned, which is the first one in my slide, which is disease refractory to medical therapy, I, I can tell you that patients are getting sicker and sicker before they come to surgery today. The surgery for ulcerative colitis is decreasing in the country, which is maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing. I think the fact that it's decreasing, it's a good thing, but the coming sicker is not necessarily a good thing. You know, So if you need surgery, um, you, you tend, to, tend to have gone through a couple of cycles of medications before you come, and I'm not going to go through the medications at this point for ulcerative colitis. Um, the other one is complications from the medical uh, therapy, which means that you can't continue on the medical therapy, therefore surgery becomes your only option. Emergency, luckily we run into this very infrequently, once or twice a year, where patients come with something called toxic megacolon, where the bowel is very distended, and we feel like it's imminently going to rupture, and that really has a significant mortality associated with it, that and perforation. Bleeding, again, is uncommon, much like Crohn's disease. What are the options when you come for emergency? Really, there's only one option, whether it's toxic megacolon or bleeding or when you're sick in the hospital, is we take out the entire colon and give you an end ileostomy where the, the, the waste comes out from your abdominal wall from an end ileostomy. This allows you to get better. The rectum stays in place. You get better, you come off all the medication, you gain weight, you gain muscle mass, and you get healthy. After this, you take a break for about two or three months to get healthy, and then you discuss future options. But this is the operation of choice for emergency surgery. Um, what about elective surgery? I would say the most commonly approached operation or the uh, you know, uh, most commonly performed operation today for this disease is an ileal J pouch which is um, uh, ileal J-pouch anastomosis, or the, you know, IPAA as it's otherwise known. The brook ileostomy is a regular ileostomy. The, regu the brook ileostomy is the same ileostomy as I mentioned earlier. It's an ileostomy that sits on the outside of the bowel, on the skin, and then you just put a bag on it and that collects waste. If you want to do it on the inside where you co cre create the pouch inside, that's called the coke pouch. That's not done much anymore. Um, and the third option, which is in a collecting with an iliorectal anastomosis, that's a very, very unlikely scenario because the disease tends to start in the rectum and very rarely do you ever get the rectum to be disease-free where you connect the small bowel back to the rectum in ulcerative colitis. There are, there are potential benefits to not doing the rectal dissection in young people and I think I'm going to touch on them in a minute. So proctocolectomy with permanent ileostomy is definitely an option. I don't think that's taken by many patients. The benefits of this is um, you remove all the disease. There's no risk of cancer. It's actually very well tolerated operations and there's no functional problems permanently. You know, essentially you, you know what you're getting. Um, the, 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 obviously the disadvantage is you have a permanent ileostomy and, and, and that's not very attractive to many people. What about leaving the rectum in place and connecting that small bowel back to the rectum when the patient is healthier? Well, the advantage is that you avoid the pelvic dissection, and the pelvic dissection causes two things, reduces fertility and causes sexual dysfunction in young men, and both are not insignificant problems, but the, the, the disadvantage to leaving it is um, the rectum that remains is at high risk of cancer, plus it might never ever be able to heal. If it's disease, you cannot connect bowel back to diseased bowel. So that scenario is not common because the rectum stays diseased and we cannot connect the ileum, which is the stoma, back. So if patients are doing, they're having family planning or, or, or you know, young women want to get pregnant, they might want to just leave the ileostomy, finish, you know, like do that, do that portion, 
of it first and then come back and have a pouch if the disease is still in the rectum. And I've had many patients who've sort of approached it this way. They'd say, let's leave the stoma. There is no um, time period where it's a minimum leaving the ileostomy. So you do the operation the first time, you take out the colon, give them an end ileostomy, and that can stay like this for years, and then come back and address the pouch in a different time. This is a, the operation I told you that is not done very often. This is the continent pouch, where a pouch is formed on the inside. And as you can see in this um, uh, portion E, or, or at least um, in the slide, there's a, the diagram E. You put a Foley catheter or some kind of catheter, you empty it a few times a day, and you don't actually have a bag on the outside because it's continent. It doesn't just sort of uh, produce when it wants. It, it's got so many problems that it hasn't really taken off in the country, and nobody does it today. Well, few, few people still do it. Not, not, we don't, we're not doing it. This is the operation of choice where the bowel is turned on itself and connected to the anus. So you do a proctectomy, which is removing the rectum, and you do an ileanal J pouch and astomosis. Um, the biggest um, advantage is no permanent bag. The disadvantage is you can get pouchitis, which is very common, you know, uh, recurrent inflammation in the pouch or infections. We, we don't understand it extremely well why it happens. Uh, and um, you could have some complications, and essentially it, you might have to have the pouch removed at some time in the future. <clears throat> This is one of the most important publications that came out of the Cleveland Clinic looking at early experience of doing these pouches. This was done in the 90s. They had done a thousand pouches at that time. And what they found is when you do these pouches, you have a high risk of complications after the surgery. And they recommended that you give the patients a temporary ileostomy. So a loop ileostomy when you do the pouch. So the pouch again remove, involves removing the rectum, turning the small bowel on itself, connecting that to the anus but it, you break the circuit by giving the patients a loop ileostomy and hoping to reduce that 27% rate of post-operative infectious complications. Once they get post the post -op, past the post-op period, what do you look forward to long-term? Extremely low mortality from the operation. However, I would say five to, six, five to six bowel movements in the day, one at night is about average. It can be up to 10. That's also within what you would, may, might see. There's about a one to 2% chance of sexual dysfunction in men, impotence, namely. The uh, pouchitis is very common. We, I would quote 40% to patients, pouchitis, which is inflammation in the pouch. Most of the time, it's easily treated with antibiotics. Sometimes it requires uh, more therapy. Um, uh, decreased fertility in females, and then other complications. And the diagnosis, late diagnosis, which this is where this comes into pouch, vaginal fistula, late diagnosis of Crohn's into pouches where the diagnosis is, it's always been ulcerative colitis, but after you've got the pouch done, it gets the Crohn's, and that five in a hundred pouches, I would say, get removed for those indications. So it's not common, but it can happen. What about as you get older, you know, when you're young, less than 45, the number of bowel movements, I would say about six, like I said, but the, the risk of never incontinent decreases with time, and then Patients have some time, complaint of nighttime seepage, which they have to wear a pad, and that increases with age and increases with time. So as you've had the pouch for 10, 20 years, that's what sort of you, you can expect. There's also been a, a study from the Mayo Clinic that have looked at disease 20 years out, and patients maintain their job that they had, um, and most of them keep their pouches. Again, about 95%. This is a very... Um, special situation, I will not necessarily advocate it. I just want to say that there is some data to show that in Crohn's disease, if the small bowel is spared and the anus is spared, there might be an option to do a pouch. Most of the time, Crohn's patients for some reason have TI disease and they have anal disease. So that's not a common scenario where you just have colitis from Crohn's and no, no ileal disease and no uh, anal fistulas but we, we would consider it. And it tends to, so if you, ha, if you knew you had anal disease and or small bowel disease, the likelihood of failure of a pouch from Crohn's would be about over 50, 60%. But in this scenario that I just mentioned, 70% of them actually did okay.